Hello, and welcome to Just the Bible Will Do podcast with Pastor Jonathan Smith. I want to take just a few moments today and say thank you so very much for listening to our podcast. Our podcast can be found on all major platforms with the exception of Amazon, and we're currently waiting for their approval. And uh, we're very grateful and blessed with what the Lord has done with the podcast over the last few weeks. I apologize that I missed last week. I was a little bit under the weather. and My voice wouldn't let wouldn't hold up long enough to let me do this podcast. And um, so I apologize that I missed last week, but we're looking forward to being with you this week. Let's get started with a word of prayer today. My dear Gracie, Father, Lord, we want to thank you, God, for another opportunity to be able to gather around your word. And to be able to share your word one with another. God, we pray today that you will take something that we say and let it be a blessing and a help to someone that is listening today. God, if they're lost and undone without you, Lord, we pray that you will save them before it's eternally too late. Lord, we pray today if there be someone that's backslidden, God, we pray that today would be the day that they would rededicate their heart and their life back to you and serve you. Uh, to their fullest potential, potential, which is their reasonable service. God, we pray for those that have love that has lost loved ones due to death. Lord, we pray that you would touch them and help them as they go through this time of grievement. And God, we pray today, God, for each and every one that listens today to the podcast, whatever their need may be, that you would meet it. And all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, go with me to the book of James, chapter number 1. To today, James chapter number two. We started in the book of James, and the last time that I met with you, we finished up the Christian and his Bible. And today, I want to pick up with a different topic, and this will be part one. I want to deal with the Christian and his brethren. James chapter number two, verse number one. The Bible says, "My brethren, have not have not the faith." Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with the respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have re- excuse me, and you have the respect to him that weareth gay clothing. And saith unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath God not chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? Today when we look at James chapter number 2, James here starts off probably with an awkward statement when he says here in verse number one, Have not the faith, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. I believe James here is saying that our faith in the Lord is incompatible with partiality and discrimination. We cannot combine snobbery with faith in Christ. These two do not mix. And I want to say today, friend, that that is so very true. That it is impossible today to be successful as a Christian and treat other so-called believers like trash. Well, preacher, I don't think that they're a good Christian because if they was a good Christian, they wouldn't do this and they wouldn't do that and they wouldn't go here and they wouldn't go there and they wouldn't they wouldn't say this thing or they wouldn't say that thing. Hey, that's not up for you to judge someone's Christianity and the work of someone's Christianity. 
What you need to do today, friend, is serve God alone. Because at the end of the day, Romans chapter number 14 and verse 12, and every man must give an account of himself to God. It is not my responsibility today as a pastor for me to live my life for you. But I live my life for Christ. Because it is Christ that is seen. It is Christ that draws men unto repentance. It is Christ that is the reasoning that I live the way that I live and talk the way that I talk and do the things that I do. Without Him, I am nothing. Without Him, I can never be nothing. Without Him, my work is in vain. I don't serve God today because it makes my mama happy, it makes my daddy happy, it makes my grandpa, my grandma, my aunts, my uncles happy. I serve God today because I want to serve Him. I serve God today because He saved me by His marvelous grace. And it will be a glad day in a lot of Christians' lives when they realize that they are to serve God no matter what the cost, no matter who it pleases, who it displeases, and they are to serve God today without partiality. Do you know why today, friend, and I'm going to jump on this soapbox for just a minute, I'm going to say a few things that may hurt your feelings, and if it does, it does. If it don't, it don't. And if you agree, fine, and if you disagree, fine. It don't matter. But one of the things here that Paul, one of the things here that the writer here is saying, he says here, he deals with the indication of the problem. We see here, he said, we cannot combine, we cannot combine snobbery with faith in Christ. These two do not mix. When I think about that today, I think about something that has bothered me over the last several months and even over the last two to three years. And over the last few years, I have seen a snobbing and a partiality amongst the Baptist community. And when I say that today, I'm not talking about doctrinal issues where I'm seeing it. But I'm saying if you don't preach this certain group of preachers, then this certain group of preachers aren't going to preach you. If you don't go to these certain revival meetings, then you're not going to be a part of this little clique of preachers. Can I say something today, pastors? We are not a part of a clique, but we are a part of the family of God. And your church is no better than my church. And my church is no better than your church. Our churches may be bigger. Our churches may be smaller. But at the end of the day, the purpose of the local church is to reach the lost, encourage the saint, help the widow, help the poor, help the widower, and to spread the gospel around the entire world. And it bothers me today that when churches have revival meetings and churches have um, other preachers coming in, well, I'm not. Our church ain't going to support that meeting. Why? Well, I don't like that preacher. Well, does the preacher preach the gospel? Does the preacher tell the truth like it is? Well, yeah, he does. But I just don't like him. I don't care too much for him. I don't care too much for his ministry. Let me say something today, friend. It takes all kinds for the world to go around. There are people today that I cannot reach that you can reach, and there are people today that you cannot reach that I can reach and it's time that we put our partiality aside and it's time that we come together and we serve God and we realize that God and the gospel is our number one focus and priority amongst our local churches today and that there is no partiality and that there is no big eyes and that there is no little use inside of the church house but that we're all sinners saved by grace serving the same God going to the same heaven and we have the same goal. And I believe here the writer's seen this partiality. If we looked over throughout the Gospels we could see that God himself 
had no partiality. We know that he opened, he was open to the poor and blind Bartimaeus as he was to the rich young ruler. He was as honest and fair and forthright with the Seraphonician woman as he was with Pilate. He treated everyone with the same love, the same interest, the same care and concern. He was not condescending when he excuse me, when he was dealing with the publicans and the sinners. He never cowed down or compromised when he was dealing with those who occupied the seat of power. He gave the outcast and the untouchables the same gentle, loving compassion that he extended to the scribes and the Pharisees. The Lord oftentimes did not approve of people's behavior, but he looked beyond their faults and seen their deepest needs and treated them with, notice this, dignity. Can I ask you a question today, friend? How do you treat others? Do you treat others with respect? Or do you have your own little clique that you'll love and care for, and if they don't fit into that mold, and if they don't do this, and if they don't do that, then they're just not going to fit in at all. Let's move on this afternoon, or this evening. Verse number 2. The Bible says... For if there come unto you an assem- or come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect for him that weareth gay clothing, and that word gay means good, great, happy, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here. Under my footstool. Number one, James here on the illustration of the problem. As he sees partiality as sin against God. Number one, he shows us the prosperous man. When we see the prosperous man, he said in verse number two, For if they're coming to you, or coming to your assembly, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel. When I think about that today, he said this. What if a man comes in to your church, your assembly, your place of worship, and he has on jewelry, really nice clothing, and it seems to be very wealthy. When we look here under the gold ring, that is something that everyone would see. It would be bright and shining. He was wearing goodly apparel. The word here would be likened unto a gorgeous robe. When we think about that, this man or woman would be well dressed. This man or woman would come into our church house. I'm going to get in trouble here. That's all right. And they would be wearing their suit and their tie and their long skirt or long dress that met everyone's standards, and you would run up to them and welcome them. And you would say unto them, Sit thou here in a good place. In other words, ma'am or sir, you just come on up to the front row of the church and pull up a seat. You can come sing in our choir. You can you can teach a Sunday school class. You can do all these things. You know why? Because you fit our mold. Can I say something today? A lot of us in churches are looking for people that will fit our mold. We all have the same human nature. We're all sinners saved by grace. I don't care if you come to church in a suit and tie or if you come to church wearing shorts and a t-shirt. The gospel is the same gospel that I will preach to you. I will shake your hand. I will hug your neck. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how poor you are. You will be treated the same way. So James points out here the rich man. He said, look how good he looks. He looks like he's got it all together. And you tell him, come on up here, sit in a good place. But then James also gives us the 
poor man. He said, the poor man will come in vile raiment. And you'll say to the poor man, stand thou there, or sit under my foot, footstool. When I think about that today, I think about those that come to church that may not have the best of clothing. And some churches will say, hey, you need to dress a little better when you come to church. We don't like the we don't like that outfit you wore today. Uh, uh, it, it had too many holes in it or... Uh, you know, it 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 looked a little dirty. The next time you come to church, try to wear something a little different. Try to try to wear something that makes yourself look more presentable. When we think about that today, this word here, vile raiment, suggests that he had on old shabby clothing. When I think about that today, I. Remember, about two and a half years ago now, one Wednesday night, this gentleman came in the church. And he came in and he sat down on the back row. And I'll never forget, he had on a pair of um, khaki-covered denim carpenter pants and a flannel shirt. It was winter time. And uh, I remember the flannel shirt had a hole in it in the arm of it and I went up and I shook his hand and I said sir I want to thank you for coming to the house of God here's a visitor's card if you don't mind take a moment fill this out drop it in the offering plate or on your way out the door just hand it to me I said I won't call you I won't do anything I just would like that I just would like to have your information send you a thank you letter and he said thank you sir and he sat down on the back pew and at the end of the service, he came up to me and said, I appreciate your warm welcome, and your church is warm welcome, but the reason I came tonight is I'm homeless. And he said, I need some food. And I said, okay, that isn't a problem. So I took, so I took him back to our food pantry, and I gave him some food and gave him a Bible and sent him on his way. He asked me if there's anywhere that I knew he could stay for the night, and I told him about a homeless shelter that was right up the road from the church. He went there. Well, two or three weeks went by, and um, I got a phone call from him. He said, Preacher, this is so-and-so. Do you remember me? I said, Oh, yes, sir. I remember exactly who you are. He said, Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So he went in and told this story about how he was a carpenter and he lost his job and he lost everything he had, lost his family, lost everything. And he was down to nothing. And he said, Preacher, I would have never went to church wearing what I was wearing. But that Wednesday night that I came to your church, I wasn't wearing the best of clothes. And I said, I wasn't concerned about that. He said, I know you wasn't. He said, you and your church made me feel like a part of the family. And I said, well, I appreciate that. He said, so this past Sunday, I decided to go to a church down the street. I said, okay. And he said, preacher, I was, I went down to the church down the street, and I was sitting on the back row just like I was in your church, and I felt out of place. I felt uncomfortable. So I got up and I walked out. And as I began to walk out, a lady began to testify about the saving grace of God he said, I got, down the, I got down the steps of the church, and I turned right back around, and I went in and sat down. I said, yes, sir. And he said, when she got done, I realized what she was talking about is something that I needed. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, sir. And he said, I was calling to tell you this, preacher. I was calling to let you know that I've given my heart and my life to Christ. And had it not been for you, your church, and your kindness probably would have never darkened the doors of a church again. He said, because of that, I got saved by the grace of God. I said, no, sir, because of the love of God that he bestowed on us and we was able to share it to you is the reason you got saved. It was but the divine appointment of God that you walked in the doors of Community Baptist Church and you was able to hear the gospel. It was divine, divine appointment that you walked into this other church and you was able to hear the gospel one more time. I said, it's nothing that we did. It all belongs to God. I said all that to say this. 
when someone comes to your church the next time and their clothes don't look the best and they don't smell the best or they don't wear what you think they should wear to church, instead of looking at them and saying, God, I'd have wore something different if that was me, ask yourself, are they homeless? Have they just lost their job? Are they on the verge of committing suicide? Are they depressed? What's wrong with them? Why are they here? What do they need? Instead of looking at them and say, oh God, look at what they're wearing. What you need to look at them and say, God, give me a burden for them. And God, whatever they need, let them find it here. God doesn't care if you are rich or if you're poor. What God cares about is if you've accepted Him or rejected Him. So today, not only do we see partiality as sin against the Lord, not only do we see the problem stated, we see the indication, we see the illustration of the problem, but now I see the problem studied. We're going to finish up here in just a few moments. In verse number 4 through verse number 7. Verse 4 says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves? Uh Uh-oh. Are ye then, are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil faults? What James is asking the crowd here today is the Christian perspective to be conveyed. And James here is saying, Aren't you making a class distinction in your mind? Aren't you a, aren't you setting yourselves up to be able to judge the true quality of other people? Oh, and then he goes another part. Aren't you having evil thoughts? James here has recorded an indictment. James here said, are you making a class distinction in your mind? You know what? There's a lot of us as Christians today that have put a class distinction on what type of people should come into our churches. And we may not, and God help us, that we've done that. Or that there's only certain preachers that should be able to preach in our churches or only certain this and certain that. And I understand their standards. I understand that. But when your standards are above the Savior, you're wrong. James here said, you've now put yourself in a place that you are making class distinctions in your mind. Just because someone drives a Mercedes does not make them wealthy. Just because someone drives a Ford Fiesta doesn't make them poor. So don't, when you see a person pull up in the church in a Mercedes, they'll say, oh, we need them here. They need mo- they have money. We could use them at this church. Or when somebody pulls up in a Ford Fiesta, God, I don't even know if they make that car anymore. Somebody pulls up in a Ford Fiesta, well, we don't need them at the church. They're poor. Let me say something today, friend. It don't matter if you drive a Mercedes or if you drive a Monte Carlo you should be treated the same way at any church that you walk into. Just because a person is dressed better than another person or has a better vocabulary or more refined manners does not prove them to be a better person. My mama used to tell me growing up, pretty is as pretty does. And I want to say today, friend, it's that same way in Christianity. It's that same way in the religious sector. I don't care how much religion you talk. Your actions will speak louder than your words. C.S. Lewis, after he'd given his heart and life to Christ, decided that he would join a local church. He found himself in the company of that very collection of his neighbors that had formerly sought that he had formerly sought to avoid.
When he walked into the church, the local grocery store clerk came up to him and presented him with a hymn book. He looked around and noticed that the man over there that had boots on that squeaked, the woman in front of him wearing the ridiculous hat, and the man behind him that sang, sang off key, he found himself drawing the unwarranted conclusion that these people's faith must somehow be ridiculous. Only later did he learn that some of these people, in fact, were devout, well-taught, and valiant Christians. Believers who Satan himself had reason to fear, it was a great mistake to judge people by their appearance. It's exactly what James is saying. Not only does he die does he record the indictment, but James secondly in verse number five reviews the indictment. He says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath God hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? When you look throughout the Bible, there was a lot of poor people that God used. A person may be poor financially or socially, but they could be rich in faith. Remember, worldly goods is only temporary, but our faith in God is eternal. A person who is rich in faith holds in his hands the key to the vaults of heaven. The unlimited resources of the Godhead are at his disposal to accomplish plans and purposes of God. <coughs> Excuse me. A person might be poor in this world and yet be no less an heir to the kingdom of God. We think about Moses. He was a poor man. But God allowed him to be raised in a palace and to do a great work. David was a poor man on it, taking care of his father's sheep. And God allowed him to be the ruler of many people. Not only do we see the indictment recorded, not only do we see the indictment reviewed, but then I see the indictment repeated. The first part of verse number 6, which he have despised the poor. James here cannot seem to let the matter rest. The word for despised here suggests that the people in the church were insulting the poor and shaming them. The same word is used to describe the Jerusalem apostles after the authorities had imprisoned them, beaten them, and threatened them. They departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted, counted worthy to suffer the shame for the cause of Christ. I want to say today, friend, That I would rather be poor and not have two nickels in my pocket to rub together and know that I'm going to heaven and have faith in God than to have all the money in the world and be lost and undone without God. Not only today do we see here partiality is sin against the Lord. We see the Christian, we see the problem here has been stated not only that if we've seen the problem has been studied we see the Christian perspective conveyed and lastly today and I'm done we see the Christian perspective confirmed last part of verse number 6 do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats do, do not they blaspheme that are worthy or that worthy name by the which Ye are called. James here goes to a practical note. He says, he says here, bully Christians, oh boy, something about great wealth is corrosive to character. 
money can buy most things in this world. People who can command large sums of money often become arrogant. People whom they cannot buy, they bully. Those whom they cannot they cannot bully, they belittle. Those they cannot belittle, they try to bury. The word here that James used is oppress. Can I say something today? There are people today in our churches who aren't wealthy in financial, by financial means, but they're wealthy in spiritual knowledge, but they are nothing more than Christian bullies who try to push their weight around, who try to destroy other people because of the way they dress, because of the way they act, because of songs that they sing, because of things that they do. I'm glad today that God loved me and didn't bully me. He didn't belittle me, but instead he raised me up. Be thankful for that today. You can go throughout the Bible and see different people who tried to oppress others. In James's experience, rich men were often willing to do the work of Satan. It was not only silly but also sinful then, then to give preferential treatment to a person just because they're rich. There's no favorites with God in us as Christians today. There should be no favorites amongst us. Some people not only bully Christians by exercising power over them and oppressing them, but some also, in the last part of verse, in the first part of verse number seven, they blaspheme the name of Christ. James said, "Do not they blaspheme that or that worthy name by the which ye are called." He said, because rich people often become intoxicated with their power to manipulate their fellow man, some of them go on to blaspheme the Lord himself. In the days of the early church when James lived, the rich and powerful Sadducees were the ones who persecuted the church, dragging Christians into court and saying the most terrible things about God. And James gave a warning. Don't be partial to any man. Say, preacher, is it only rich people that are that way? Absolutely not. I have several friends that are very wealthy that today, if I called them and said, I need an X amount of dollars, they would find a will, they would have the will and find a way to get it to me. But I want to say today, friend, that it's more than wealth that gets you into heaven. And the next time, church member, you go to church, and a man and and you have multiple sets of visitors. Treat them all the same. One thing as a pastor, I've told my church, I don't care if a person comes in and they're clean cut, clean shaved, and look like they just walked out of a barber shop, or if they walk in the doors and they look like they just came off from sleeping under a bridge. We want them to leave Community Baptist Church knowing. That God loves them. My dear gracious Father, Lord, thank you for allowing us to teach your word. God, we pray that something that was said or done on this podcast today will be a help and a blessing to someone. God, we pray today, Lord, that you wouldn't let your return, word return void. God, we pray today, Lord, that you have allowed your word to speak. And all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so very much for listening to the podcast today. Feel free to send me an email, pastorsmith387 at gmail.com. If you come across this podcast on YouTube, feel free to leave me a comment. Let me know that you've watched. If you ever have any questions or concerns, please feel free to email me. Until we meet again, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. Thank you. God bless.